Welcome to the Affordable Care Act Training Session 4, Pay or Play Penalty and Minimum Essential Coverage Reporting, the 6056 reporting on the 1094 and 1095 C forms. This ACA training session is for informational purposes only and is not legal advice or a substitute for legal advice. It is designed only for employers that offer the health plan administered by the Georgia Municipal Association on behalf of the Georgia Municipal Employees Benefit System and contains information that is not applicable to other employers. This ACA training session reflects the presenter's understanding of certain requirements of the Affordable Care Act as they existed on June 1, 2015. This ACA training session is not an official document of the health plan. Only the official health plan documents establish the terms of the health plan. GMA has provided a series of Affordable Care Act training sessions. Session 1 was for all employers, entitled Waiting Period Rules, How to Determine Applicable Large Employer Status. Session 2 was just for applicable large employers. It covers pay or play penalty rules. Session 3 is designed for smaller employers, Minimum Essential Coverage Reporting, the 6055 reporting on the 1094B and 1095B forms. This session is training session four, pay or play penalty and minimum essential coverage reporting requirements, the 6056 reporting on the 1094C and 1095C forms. It is for applicable large employers only, and it is essential that applicable large employers have already reviewed session one and session two. All of these training sessions are posted on gmanet.com under Life and Health, More Information. The Section 6056 reporting with the C-Forms includes reporting to the IRS and to the employee. The GMEBS Health Plan is an employer-sponsored, self-insured plan for multiple employers. So all participating employer ALEs must file Forms 1094C and 1095C with Part 3, the Minimum Essential Coverage portion, completed for all enrollees. The GMEBS Health Plan is not a multi-employer plan or a governmental sponsored program. Although these terms seem to apply, a multi-employer plan is a defined term that means a union plan where the plan is governed by a collective bargaining agreement. The term governmental sponsored program refers to Medicare or Medicaid, but not to the GMEBS health plan. For reporting purposes, whenever you see in, in the instructions the term plan sponsor or coverage provider, that means the employer. GMA will not report any coverage to the IRS or to enrollees, and GMA cannot file any forms on behalf of participating employers. The employer has the obligation to file, even if it has very limited interaction with the enrolled individual. It does not matter if the employer is not paying any part of the coverage and is not collecting premiums. The employer must report for all ACA full-time employees, but also must report for everyone enrolled in the GMEBS plan, even if no longer employed. Employers with retirees who are enrolled in the GMEBS retiree-only health plan on a fully self-paid basis still have to file forms for them. However, if these enrolled retirees were not employed during the year, they can be reported using either the B forms or the C forms. The filings are due January 31st of the year after the year of coverage to ACA full-time employees and enrolled individuals, and the last day of February of the year after the year of coverage to IRS or March 31st if the filing is electronic. In order to complete Forms 1094-C and 1095-C, the participating employer must figure out whether it will have to pay pay or play penalties, and that means it's important to look at this well in advance of the actual filing year. That means the employer has to identify all ACA full-time employees, determine the months for which they and their dependents were offered coverage, and determine whether the coverage offered met the affordability requirements. Payroll systems and vendors can help with the creation and even filing of the C-Forms. Payroll software is available to create the C-Forms. Consider asking your payroll vendor about training. 
Remember that in new information must be entered into the payroll software. Some payroll vendors are filing C forms on behalf of clients, and there are also some standalone vendors who will work with your existing payroll software to help you create and file the forms. GMA can help a little, but the employer must submit a help wanted certification and request in order to get GMA's help. To see how GMA can help, please review the June memorandum entitled Affordable Care Act Mandatory Reporting Requirements for All Participating Employers of Any Size and review the attached certification and request form for applicable large employers. These materials describe the enrollment data files and how GMA will fill out the B forms for non-employees if requested. This, if the certification and request form is submitted to GMA by August 1st, then GMA can provide the requested data files and or the B forms by the first week in January. Remember, the employer will have to mail all forms to ACA full-time employees and enrolled primary responsible individuals by January 31st. And that's not much time um, from the time you get the information from GMA, first week in January. The employer will also have to file all forms with the IRS by the applicable deadline. Applicable large employers must complete the C forms for all active ACA full-time employees, even those not enrolled, and for anyone enrolled as an active employee or his or her dependent during the year. For those who were non-employees, such as COBRA or retirees, and they were never enrolled as an active employee during the year, the ALE must either report the minimum essential coverage on Part 3 of 1095C or may file the 6055 reporting B forms for these individuals. That information about those B forms is explained in ACA Training Session 3. So an ALE can choose either to use just the C forms for everything or use the C forms and the B forms. Why would an applicable large employer want to complete C and B forms? Well, we're not sure yet, but maybe if it's difficult to put information about someone who was not employed during the year into the payroll system that is generating the C forms, and the ALE prefers for GMA to prepare the B forms so that the ALE can simply mail them, that might be a reason. Another might be if the ALE prefers not to include information about non-employees in its payroll system for other reasons. To learn more about the B forms for non-employees, see Training Session 3. GMA's data files give applicable large employers the flexibility to choose. The 1094C transmittal form has attached to it the full Social Security number version of all the 1095C forms. So the employer will send the 1094C transmittal form and a copy of every um, individual statement 1095C form to the IRS. The 1095C form with the last four digits of the social security number is provided directly to the um, ACA full-time employee and each enrolled responsible individual. Although the 1094C is called a transmittal form, it is not just a transmittal form. In addition to providing information about the employer, including contact information for the IRS to, to reach with questions, the 1094C includes a certification of the employer's eligibility for pay or play penalty relief, and it includes a self-report of whether the employer could be hit with a sledgehammer penalty. It also identifies the number of 1095C forms that are attached. The GMA data files will not include any information needed to fill out the 1094C form. 1095C form has three parts. In part one, there's information about the individual who's getting the form and there's information about the employer. GMA data files will include part one, lines one through six, which has information about the primary responsible individual for enrollees only. GMA does not have information about anyone who is an ACA full-time employee who was not enrolled. Part two 
includes a self-report about whether the employer could be hit with a tack hammer penalty for failing to offer ACA full-time employees minimum essential coverage with minimum value that met affordability requirements. Part two is mostly about offer of coverage. And for that reason, GMA does not have most of the information that is needed for part two. Only the employer knows who it offered coverage to and what the employee only cost of coverage was. But in line 16, that line 16 does have a code for if the person is enrolled and the GMA data files will include information about enrollment. Part three has a report of enrollment in minimum essential coverage for each month for the primary responsible individual and each enrolled dependent. Part three is all about enrollment and the GMA data files include all information necessary to complete part three. ALEs with fewer than 100 ACA full-time employees and FTE equivalents may be eligible for a one-year delay in pay or play penalties. But even if they're eligible for that one-year penalty delay, the applicable large employer must still submit 1094C and 1095C. So remember, any employer that is an ALE with has 50 or more ACA full-time employees and full-time employee equivalents, reporting is required. This training session does not address how to complete the C-forms if the participating employer is a member of a controlled group. To refresh your memory on controlled group rules, see training session one. This training session does not address how to complete the C-forms if the participating employer has formally delegated responsibility for filing to another governmental entity that is part of or related to the participating employer. This training session assumes that the employer is not using any simplified or alternative reporting options. Although there are different options that are called simplified or alternative, uh, they are not as simple as one would hope and they are outside the scope of this training. This training session assumes that the participating employer does not offer any health coverage other than GMEB's health coverage. And all examples in the training are based on these assumptions. How do you prepare to complete the 1094 and 1095C forms? Well, first, you only need to complete these forms if you're an applicable large employer. And when making that determination, you can review training session one. Just a reminder, ACA uses special math. The ALE determination is based on information from any six consecutive months in 2014. You will use the same numbers that you used when determining ALE status to determine whether you have 50 to 99 ACA full-time employees or equivalents or 100 or more. This is an important calculation because it determines what kind of pay or play penalty relief you have for 2015. So whenever we talk about 50 to 99 ACA full-time employees or 100 plus, we're always using that calculation that came from the original determination of whether you are an ALE. This is a slide from training session one, just a brief reminder of all that goes into figuring out whether you're an ALE. Uh, there's a number of steps um, and there's special math. If you do the math and you determine that you have between 50 and 99 ACA full-time employees and full-time employee equivalents, you can qualify for the one year delay in pay or play penalty if from February 9th, 2014 to January 1st, 2015, you didn't reduce the size of your workforce or reduce the overall hours of service of employees in order to qualify for transition relief. You also have to um, have not eliminated or materially reduced your health coverage that was offered between that time frame. When you complete your form, if you check that you are eligible for that one year delay relief, that is a certification that you qualify. The pay or play penalty rules will become applicable for you in 2016 instead of 2015, but you will still need to file the 1094 and 1095C forms. 
to prepare for filing the 1094C and 1095C forms, you're going to need to identify all employees in each month during 2015. You'll need to identify all employees who were ACA full-time employees for pay or play penalty purposes for each month. Remember, for pay or play penalty purposes, you use measurement periods and stability periods to determine whether a person was an ACA full-time employee. For each ACA full-time employee, determine for which months GMEB's coverage was offered. If you offer coverage to somebody during annual enrollment, that counts as an offer of coverage for each month of the following year, as long as the person was employed in each of those months. If you offered coverage due to new hire or special enrollment, that counts as an offer of coverage for every following month of the year for which the employee could have been enrolled in coverage as long as employed. If a person declined coverage and if employment terminates mid-month, he's not considered to have been offered coverage for that final month. For each month, calculate the percentage of ACA full-time employees for which GMEB's coverage was offered. For any month coverage was not offered to an ACA full-time employee and dependent children, determine why no penalty should apply. Some examples, the individual was not employed during that month, or the individual was not an ACA full-time employee during that month, or the individual was in a limited non-assessment period during that month. Finally, you need to identify the cost of employee-only coverage for the cheapest GMEBS option you offer and I need, you need to identify which affordability safe harbor will be used. 1094C examples will address Big Happy City and Not So Big Happy City. They're both applicable large employers. Big Happy City has over 100 ACA full-time employees and full-time equivalents. It offered GMEBS coverage to 95% or more ACA full-time employees in 2015. Not so big Happy City has 50 to 99 ACA full-time employees and full-time equivalents. It's eligible for the 2015 only one-year delay in pay or play penalties. Not so big employed 85 ACA full-time employees. Of these, 27 did not meet the GMEB's regular employee definition. Their positions required 30 or more hours per week, but were only expected to last seven months, not 48 weeks. So, these 27 individuals did not meet the regular employee definition. And, starting January 1, Not So Big had the option of offering them coverage if it found out they were ACA full-time employees, but Not So Big chose not to offer them the coverage. As a result, Not So Big offered GMEBs to less than 70% of ACA full-time employees in 2015. Here is 1094C for Big Happy City. In line seven, Henrietta Clerk is listed as the person that the IRS should contact with questions. Do not name anyone at GMA. Over here, lines nine through 16 are blank. That is because the designated government entity designation is not applicable. Over here, in uh, lines 19 and in lines 21, this is where the city is saying how many of the uh, 1095C forms are attached to this form. So Big Happy City enters 175 here in line 18 and also here in line 20. Line 19 asks, is this the authoritative transmittal for this ALE member? The answer is yes and so X is checked on line 19. In line 22, Big Happy City enters a checkbox for C because the section 4980H transition relief applies. Boxes A, B, and D are left blank because Big Happy City is not doing any of these so-called simplified reporting methods. Here is where Henrietta Clerk signs that she has examined the return and documents and to the best of her knowledge and belief they are true, correct, and complete. She submits this form and signs it on January 25th. Here is 1094C for not so big happy city. 
in this case, Charles Clerk is the person that the IRS will be contacting if they have any questions. Again, the transmittal is authoritative, 9 through 16 are blank, but not so big is attaching 85 1095C forms. So 85 is entered here on line 18 and also here on line 21. The um, section 4980H transition relief box is checked. It's a different type of relief, but you, uh, not so big also checks section 4980H transition relief C. And again, no simplified reporting methods are being used. Charles Clerk signs here and dates it on the date it will be filed. For 1094C, we've already completed part one, we've completed part two, so now it's time to look at part three. This is the self-report of whether the employer could be hit with the sledgehammer penalty. And it also identifies the type of pay or play penalty relief that the employer will be entitled to. The sledgehammer penalty cannot apply for a month if the ALE offered the GMEBS health plan to 95% or more ACA full-time employees in that month. That's 70% for 2015. For an offer of coverage to count, it must have been available to the ACA full-time employee for every day of the month. If coverage can only start in the middle of the month, it won't count as an offer of coverage for that month. An employer makes an offer of coverage to an employee if it provides the employee an effective opportunity to enroll in the health coverage or to decline that coverage at least once for each plan year. An employer makes an offer of health coverage to an employee for the plan year if it continues the employee's election of coverage from a prior year, but provides the employee an effective opportunity to opt out of the health coverage. That explains why offers of coverage at annual enrollment, even ones where the employee is automatically continued in the coverage as long as the employee had an option to opt out. That's why that offer counts as an offer for all of the remaining year as long as the employee was actually employed. A limited assessment period is a time when there is no penalty for failure to offer coverage. It includes a waiting period, the initial measurement period and administrative period and the calendar month of employment if the first day is not the first day of the month. See training session two for more information about these periods. There are two types of pay or play penalty relief. Type A is if the employer is not subject to any pay or play penalties for 2015 coverage because it has certified that it is eligible for the 50 to 99 one year penalty delay relief. Pay or play penalty relief type B is if the employer had over 100 ACA full-time employees or full-time employee equivalents in 2014 and is eligible for the 100 or more relief. That means that the sledgehammer penalty for 2015 coverage is based on the number of ACA full-time employees minus 80 instead of minus 30. 1094C part three, column A, when you complete column A, indicate for each month whether you offered at least employee plus dependent children coverage under the GMEBS health plan to at least 95% of your ACA full-time employees. Remember, this is 70% for 2015. When you're counting the number of ACA full-time employees, do not include any ACA full-time employees who are in a limited assessment period. If you can answer that you offered the right percentage in every single month of the year, you want to check yes next to all 12 months. If you can't answer that for every single month, you'll need to enter it the months in which you can enter yes and enter no for the ones where you have to answer no. Let's look at B. In column B, you're going to add the number of full-time employees, ACA full-time employees, in each month. Big Happy City had a remarkably stable workforce and the number was 175 ACA full-time employees for every single month. When counting ACA full-time employees, do not include those that are in a limited assessment period. For column C, this is where the employer is going to enter the total employees for every single month. When counting employees for column C, add all employees, 
even those who are part-time and even those who are in a limited assessment period. When counting, you need to use the same time each month, either the first or last days of the month, or the first or last days of the first payroll period of the month, as long as that day falls within the calendar month. So again, Big Happy City had a remarkably stable workforce with exactly 200 total employees every single month of uh, 2015. Column D is the aggregated group indicator, and it's not appropriate because there's no control group issues here. So Big Happy City leaves column D blank. Big Happy City has 100 or more ACA full-time employees. So Big Happy City enters B up here in column E. That is the type of 4980H transition relief that Big Happy City is entitled to. It is the one for 100 or more ACA full-time employees and equivalents. Remember, that's counted using the applicable large employer status counting method. Not so big enters no because it did not offer coverage to 70% of all ACA full-time employees in any month of 2015. It would be very unusual for this to happen. Employers must offer the GMEMS plan to regular employees. Those are the employees who are in a position that requires 30 or more hours of service per month and is expected to last 48 weeks or more. Employers may always offer GMEBS to anyone it determines to be an ACA full-time employee. So this is kind of a far-flung example. Remember, this is where the 27 ACA full-time employees who only worked for seven months were not offered coverage. Over here in column B, not so big says that it had 85 ACA full-time employees every month of the year. And it had in column C, 95 employees for every month of the calendar year. In column E, the big, not so big happy city certifies that no penalties can apply because of the one year delay for ALEs with 50 to 99 full-time employees and equivalents. So that's indicated with A in column E. We've looked at part one and part two of 1095C. Now we're going to look at part three. GMA data files will include information needed to complete part three. Ten ninety five C has John Smith entered here because John Smith is the ACA full time employee or the primary responsible individual who's enrolled, even if not an ACA full time employee. For enrolled individuals, the employer could use the GMA data file to complete lines one through six because GMA data file will include the name and the address of the primary responsible individual who's enrolled or the employer could use the information from their payroll systems. Lines 7, 8, 9, and 11 through 13, you use the same information that was entered on Form 1094C. This is information about the employer, um, and it should match exactly with what was on the transmittal form. But line 10 
the contact information could be different from the contact on 1094C. This is the individual who will get calls with questions from the individuals who get the form. Like with the transmittal form, it's not going to be anybody at GMA, but it may be an employer wants to have a different contact for uh, the IRS than it does for the form that goes to the individuals. Let's take a look at part two of 1095C. In line 14, it's the offer of coverage, and there are special codes. You can't ever leave line 14 blank on the 1095C form. Line 14 will use the code series one, and there'll be more about that in a minute. Line 15 is where you enter what you charge for the employee-only version of the lowest cost GMEBS option you offer. And line 16, you're going to enter a code that says the reason why you meet the affordability requirements using code series two. Lines 15 and 16 will be blank if you did not offer coverage for that month or if the individual was not an ACA full-time employee for any month of the year, but was still enrolled. Let's look at code series one. There are two codes that mean GMEB's coverage was offered for the month. Code 1E, I like to call it everyone in family offered coverage, means minimum essential coverage providing minimum value was offered to you and minimum essential coverage offered to your dependents and spouse. That's the information that the employee will read when it gets the statement. That is the explanation for code 1E. There's also code 1B, but not dependents. Minimum essential coverage providing minimum value was offered to you and minimum essential coverage not offered to your spouse or dependents. Note, discuss with counsel before entering this code. There's a penalty risk if the employer does not offer coverage for dependent children, but transition relief may apply. This code is also sometimes used for COBRA and maybe retiree coverage when the individual selects uh, self-only COBRA or retiree coverage. The code 1H is for when you did not offer GMEBS coverage for the month. I like to remember, heck no, coverage was not offered. No offer of coverage. You were not offered any health coverage or you were offered coverage that is not minimum essential coverage. That is what will, the employee will read on their statement. Employees who were not ACA full-time employees for any month of the year, but who actually enrolled in GMEBS coverage at, at some point during the year, have a special code. So some examples of these types of individuals would be non-ACA full-time employees who are eligible to be in the plan because of their statutory position, such as an elected member of the city's governing authority, retirees, COBRA former employees, and COBRA beneficiaries who made a separate COBRA election. These are individuals who are not employees of the employer, but are still eligible to be in GMEB's coverage in some cases. If you have somebody like that who was not a, a, an employee at any point during the year, you're going to enter code 1G. That says you were not a full-time employee for any month of the calendar year, but you were enrolled in self-insured employer-sponsored coverage for one or more months. That has to be entered in the all 12 months box on line 14. If you enter code 1G, the rest of part two is left blank. Uh, just a reminder, GMA cannot advise whether any individual is an ACA full-time employee. There are a number of other codes in code series one. They really do not apply. And so I'm just going to explain why. Codes 1A and 1I relate to the alternative simplified reporting, which is beyond the scope of this presentation. Code 1C is not applicable because the GMEB's eligibility rules do not per permit participating employers to offer coverage only to employees and dependent children. You only have the choice of offering to employees only or to employees and all family members. 
Code 1D is also not applicable because GMEB's eligibility rules don't permit the employer to offer coverage only to employees and spouses. And Code 1F is not applicable because GMEB's coverage is minimum essential coverage that provides minimum value. On line 15, this is where the employer tells the IRS whether the employee received an offer of coverage that was affordable as defined by ACA. And as you recall from training session two, affordable only looks at the cost of the employee only coverage. So the form instructs you to enter the employee share of the lowest cost monthly premium for self only minimum value coverage. So all GMEB's options are minimum value. So enter 0, 0.00 if you offer employee only GMEB's coverage at no cost or enter the employee's cost for employee only coverage under your cheapest GMEB's option. Leave this blank if no offer was made for the month. The form will tell the recipient this line reports the employee share of the lowest cost monthly premium for minimum essential coverage providing minimum value that your employer offered you. The amount reported on line 15 may not be the amount you paid for coverage if, for example, you chose to enroll in more expensive coverage, such as family coverage. GMA cannot provide any information about the cost that individuals paid for coverage. It is the employer's um, who has the information about what they actually charge the employee. On line 16, you use code series two. This line tells the IRS why no penalties should apply. It helps me to remember the order of using these codes by saying CADs go first. The first code is code 2C. If the employee was actually covered for each day of the month, enter 2C, even if another code fits. Then try code 2A. If the employee was not employed on any day of the month, enter 2A. Code 2D is entered if the employee was in a limited non-assessment period or an initial measurement period during the month. Code 2B applies only if codes 2C, 2A, and 2D don't apply. And one of the following has to be true. The employee was found not to be an ACA full-time employee for the month, or with the mid-month termination rule, the employee was an ACA full-time employee who declined enrollment and ended employment mid-month. Or to be could be used if they were actually enrolled an ACA full-time employee earlier in the year, but coverage ended mid-month due to termination of employment. 2B is also used for the month of January 2015 only if there was no coverage for every single day, but ACA affordable coverage was offered no later than the first day of the first payroll period of January 2015. Codes 2F, 2G, and 2H are codes that prove that the offer of coverage was affordable under the safe harbor. That would be uh, 2F is the W-2 safe harbor, 2G is the federal poverty line safe harbor, and 2H is the rate of pay safe harbor. Code 2E is not applicable because it relates to union plans. We're about to discuss a series of examples of different situations and how part two of 1095C will be completed to report that information. You may want to pause the program at this point and print out these sample slides so that you can uh, look at them while the presentation is going on. Example one, John Smith is an ACA full-time employee for the 2015 stability period. At annual enrollment in 2014, he was offered employee only and family coverage, but he chose employee only coverage. He was enrolled all 12 months of 2015. In line 14, 1E is entered because during annual enrollment, everyone in the family was offered coverage for all 12 months, even though John did not enroll dependents. In line 15, the zero was entered because the lowest cost monthly premium for employee only coverage was zero. In line 16, the code 2C was entered 
because there was no tack hammer penalty when the employee was actually covered. In example two, John Smith terminates employment on July 5th and coverage ends July 31st. John does not enroll in COBRA. In line 14, 1 E is entered for January all the way through July because for the same reasons we discussed before. But for August through December, when he is no longer an employee, 1 H, heck, no coverage was offered for those months. In line 15, zero is entered for the cost of the coverage that was offered from January through July, but it's left blank for August through December. When there's no offer of coverage, you do not include the cost of any coverage. For line 16, 2C actually covered is entered for January all the way through July, and then 2A is entered for August through December because he was not employed on any day of the month for August through December. What if John terminates employment July 5th, coverage ends July 31st, and John enrolls in employee-only COBRA? Well, the lowest cost of employee-only COBRA is $450 per month, so that amount is entered in line 15 for August through December. In line 14, the annual enrollment offer to employee and family counts as an offer of coverage for the months of actual employment or enrollment. So 1E, everyone and family offered coverage, is used for January all the way through July because the coverage offered at annual enrollment counts for that period of time while he was employed. For August through December, 1B is entered, but not dependents. That is used with, because he actually chose COBRA employee only coverage. That's based on recent guidance. There's no tack hammer penalty for the entire year because of his coverage. He was actually covered, so 2C is entered in all 12 months. In example three, John was hired January 5th and enrolled on March 1st after the waiting period. For January and February, line 14 says 1H, heck, no offer of coverage for January and February because of the waiting period. The new higher offer of enrollment was for everyone. Everyone in the family was offered coverage and that was effective from March all the way through December because that was the earliest he could have enrolled in that coverage. In line 15, it's blank for January and February because there was no offer of coverage. And the lowest cost of employee only coverage for March through December was zero. Line 16, 2D is entered for January and February. There's no tack hammer penalty because John was in a limited non-assessment period in January and February. For the rest of the year, John was 2C covered. In example four, John chose family coverage. You'll note that part two of the form looks the same as example one, because for purposes of part two, it doesn't matter whether dependents actually enroll. What if Big Happy City charges $75 for employee only coverage? Well, if John Smith still enrolls, uh, there's no need to explain why $75 meets an affordability safe harbor. Line 16 is entered with 2C. And in line 15, the lowest cost of the employee only coverage, $75, is entered. What if Big Happy City charges $75 for employee only coverage and John does not enroll? Well, in that case, Big Happy City does have to explain that the cost of coverage at $75 is affordable. By entering 2G, Big Happy City is telling the IRS that the tack hammer penalty won't apply because $75 for employee only coverage meets the federal poverty line safe harbor. For more about safe harbor, see training session two, slide 45. Remember, 1E is entered 
because everyone was offered coverage for all 12 months, even though John declined. In example seven, John did not enroll and he leaves employment in the middle of the month. For a mid-month termination of employment for an ACA full-time employee who is not enrolled in coverage, there's a special code. Since John terminated employment in the middle of July, the offer of coverage during annual enrollment does not count as an offer for that month. So one H is offered for July. Since John was actually employed for part of July, 2B has to be entered on line 16 to show why no tack hammer penalty should apply. 2A, not employed on any day of the month, is used for the rest of the year. Claudia Counterpoint is a council member. Big Happy City determined she is not an ACA full-time employee for 2015. She was eligible for GMEB's coverage due to her status as a member of the governing authority. She was not re-elected, so her coverage terminated on March 31st and she did not elect COBRA. Because she was not an ACA full-time employee in any month of the year, Big Happy City enters 1G in line 14 and leaves lines 15 and 16 blank. Big Happy City must complete the 1095C form because Claudine Counterpoint was an active employee during the year. And we'll discuss part three later on in the program. Example nine, Raphael Retiree has been retired from Big Happy City for years. He received an immediate BHC retirement annuity and enrolled in the GMEB's retiree only health plan. He pays the entire cost of coverage. He was enrolled for all 12 months. The information for lines one through six is provided on the GMA non-employees data file. In line 14, 1G is entered because Raphael was not an ACA full-time employee in any month of the year. Big Happy City enters 1G and leaves lines 15 and 16 blank. Unlike Claudine Counterpoint, Big Happy City could have chosen not to file C forms for Raphael and instead have filed B forms that were prepared by GMA because Raphael was not enrolled as an active employee during the year. In example 10, Roberto was offered family coverage during the 2014 annual enrollment and he elected family coverage. Due to his retirement, Roberto's coverage in the active plan ended March 31st. He enrolled in the retiree only plan, but his wife selected COBRA coverage for herself and their son. The lowest cost of the retiree only plan for employee only coverage is $275. Two 1095C forms have to be filed for this family. This part looks just at part two of Roberto New Retiree's form. 1E, everyone in the family offered coverage, is entered for January through March. But because he enrolled in employee only retiree coverage, 1B is entered for the rest of the year. This is a guess as to how this will apply for retirees that's based on the COBRA guidance that was available June 1st, 2015. 2C, covered throughout the year, is entered on line 16 because Roberta was covered under the active plan for January through March and then covered under the retiree only plan for April through December. Big Happy City must file a separate Form 1095-C for Roberto's wife, Jane, because she elected COBRA for herself and their son. The GMA active data file will provide information in lines one through six about the address and contact information for Jane, spouse, new retiree. As of June 1st, 2015, there's no clear guidance about what to report in part two for Jane, only that the spouse must receive a separate form 1095B or 1095C 
that reports her as being enrolled. 1G might be appropriate, or it might be appropriate to leave part two blank. Certainly, it would be appropriate to leave lines 15 and 16 blank. Part three, proof of minimum essential coverage. This part of the form tells the IRS and the primary responsible individual which months the primary responsible individual and his or her dependents had minimum essential coverage. Remember, anyone who was actually enrolled in GMEP's coverage for a month cannot trigger a pay or play penalty for that month. Anyone who was actually enrolled in GMEP's coverage for a month cannot be penalized by the IRS for failure to have min minimum essential coverage for that month. GMA data files will provide information needed to complete Part 3. A participating employer must complete Part 3 for any person who was enrolled and who was an employee or a dependent of an active employee. If an employee is covered as a dependent spouse or child of another employee, Part 3 should be completed only on the Form 1095-C for the employee who enrolled the dependent. Let's take a closer look at the GMA data files that will be provided if the employer submits the certification request for help. GMA's active file will provide all this information about the primary responsible individual. This is the primary in responsible individual who is flagged as an active employee during the year at any point during the year or flagged as a dependent of an active employee who selected independent COBRA coverage during the year. GMA will also provide a non-employees file. That file reports information where the primary responsible individual is not flagged as being an active employee at any time during the year. The data elements are exactly the same. Let's look at some examples for 1095C Part 3. This is how you complete 1095C Part 3 when there is an ACA full-time employee who is not enrolled in any month. Big Happy City charges $75 for employee-only coverage and John does not enroll. You'll remember this is example 6. Um, down here under Covered Individuals, this entire section in Part 3 is left blank. If the ACA full-time employee did not enroll, leave Part 3 blank, do not check any boxes. And remember, there won't be any information about this person in the GMA data files. From example one, John was enrolled all 12 months. When that is the case, this checkbox is completed and all 12 months is checked here. The GMA active data file will show coverage for all 12 months. From example two, when there's um, a full-time employee is enrolled as an active employee for part of the year and then employment is terminated, you simply check the box and then check the box for each month in which the person was covered. That information will also come from the GMA active data file. This example shows when John terminates employment and then enrolls in COBRA for the rest of the year. Um, the part three uh, simply shows that he was covered for all 12 months and this box is checked. In example four, John shows family coverage. He and his wife were enrolled all 12 months. Newborn Smith's social security number was not available, so the date of birth is used when reporting her coverage. Part two, as we said before, is exactly the same um, as when he just selected employee-only coverage, but part three is different because it shows coverage for dependents. John was covered all 12 months. His wife Mary was covered all 12 months but Newborn Smith um, was covered only for uh, October through December because he was born on October 1st. Um, the date of birth is used because the social security number is not yet available. This shows Claudia Counterpoint's part three of the 1095C. 
The GM8 active data file will provide the information necessary for Part 3. Because Claudia CounterPoint is flagged in the GMA system as enrolled due to active employment during the year. Raphael Retiree's Part 3 of the 1095C will contain information from the GMA non employees data file. Uh, the non employees data file will also provide the employee information in lines 1 through 6, which the employer may not have um, as up to date because. The employer is not regularly interacting with Raphael Retiree. The reason it will come from the non-employees data file is because Raphael was enrolled but never flagged as enrolled due to active employment during the year. Roberto, new retiree, was enrolled as an active employee with family coverage for part of the year and then he retired and became enrolled as a retiree in the retiree health plan with single coverage for part of the year. This shows that part three is completed with Roberto new retiree's information and his wife and his son. Roberto's coverage is selected as covered all 12 months because he was covered for January through March under the active plan and then for the rest of the year he was in the retiree only health plan. The, um, the active file will only show coverage for Jane and Henry for January through March. Remember, Jane is going to get a separate 1095C that shows the coverage she elected as a COBRA beneficiary. The active data file will provide employee information in lines one through six for Jane, and will show that Jane, here in part three, there will be information in the active data file showing coverage for Jane and Henry for the months in which they had COBRA coverage. Remember, this will show up on the active data file because Jane and Henry were flagged as enrolled due to Roberto's active employment for part of the year. 1095C Part 3 will be blank for seven month Stephen. This was an example for not so big Happy City who did not offer coverage to seven month Stephen um, even though he was an ACA full-time employee. So he got the 1095C because he was an ACA full-time employee and he was not offered coverage and this part three is left blank, not offered coverage. In future years, penalties could apply for failure to offer coverage while the ACA full-time employee was employed. How are 1094C and 1095C filed with the IRS and delivered to ACA full-time employees and the enrolled primary responsible individuals. The employer completes 1095C form two times. The IRS gets a copy of the 1095C with the full social security numbers. The ACA full-time employees and enrolled primary responsible individuals get a copy of the 1095C with only the last four digits of the social security number. The 1095C goes to the individual identified in lines one through six, even if the enrolled dependents live at a different address. A dependent who made a separate COBRA election will have his or her own 1095C form with the address listed in lines one through six. The employer may provide the exact same form to both the IRS and the individual with the full social security number, but this may not be advisable due to security concerns. The employer has to file all 1095C statements with full social security number along with the 1094C transmittal form with the IRS. All employers may file electronically with the IRS. Only employers filing fewer than 250 forms may file by mail. Deadline for filing is February 28th of the year following the year being reported or February 29th if it's a leap year. That's if filing by mail. You get more time to file if you're filing electronically. You get until March 31st. The 1095C form must be mailed by first class mail to the last known permanent address or if no, none is known to the temporary address. That will be the address that's on lines one through six. Electronic delivery is permitted, but 
there are complicated consent rules, which are a big hassle, and so um, we recommend mailing by first class mail. The deadline for delivery of the 1095C is 131 of the year following the year being reported. Remember, this is before the IRS deadline. For active employees only, the statement may be hand delivered in accordance with W-2 delivery rules. For retirees, COBRA enrollees, individuals who are ACA full-time employees or enrolled during the year but are not active employees at the time of delivery, the only acceptable methods are first class mail to the last known permanent address or electronic if the consent rules are followed. For active employees who are active at the time of delivery, the only acceptable methods are mail or hand delivery or electronic if those consent rules are followed. Keep in mind these key dates. August 1st, 2015 is the deadline for submitting the certification and request form to GMA. This is required in order for GMA to provide the data files and the B forms by the first week in January 2016. Monday, February 1st, 2016 is the deadline for delivery of the 1095C to the ACA full-time employees and primary responsible individuals who are enrolled. That's because January 31st falls on a Sunday in 2016. Monday, February 29th, 2016 is the deadline for mailing the 1094C transmittal and all 1095Cs to the IRS. Thursday, March 31st, 2016 is the deadline for electronic filing of 1094C and all 1095Cs to the IRS. What are the penalties for failure to provide this reporting? In general, failure to file or provide correct statements or returns can lead to penalties of $100 for each return or statement capped at $1.5 million per year. Penalties can increase if there is intentional disregard for the, making the reports. Reports in 2016 for 2015 coverage. There will be no penalties if the employer makes good faith efforts to comply. Remember, all applicable large employers must file these reports. Penalties for failure to file the forms are separate from the sledgehammer and tackhammer pay or play penalties. Keep careful records. Records of your eligibility for the 50 to 99 one year delay, identification of ACA full-time employees, proof of limited assessment periods, initial measurement periods, proof that enrollment documents were provided, and proof of satisfaction of affordability safe harbors. Thank you very much for your time and please feel free to contact me if you have questions about this presentation.